Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. This lecture is a continuation on my series on plant form and function. And what I want to talk about today are the roots, the shoots, and the leaves. And especially there are many different types of functions. I mean, roots, shoots, and leaves do a lot more than what you might think. They're quite diverse. I mean, that's what you'd expect with like 280,000 to 300,000 plants, right? You would expect these things to be quite varied in their form and their function. What I'm not going to get in today, and something just seems different today. Hmm, can't figure it out. Maybe I lost weight or something. I don't know. I just feel like I look different today. Could be a loss of beard. Oh, I'm not wearing a flannel shirt. It must be laundry day or something. No, it's actually just really hot outside, so I'm wearing a, a nice summer shirt. But let's get back to form and function. So think about this. So what do plants have to do in order to be a multicellular autotroph? Man, that's a lot of words again, but we'll get to it. Plants, they're multicellular, right? They're made up of thousands, millions, billions, trillions of cells in larger plants. And there's just not a colony of cells either. They are differentiated into different tissues that form tissue systems and form organs like the leaves. Now, when I say a plant is autotrophic, think auto means self, troph means feeding level. So if you're autotrophic, you're self-feeding. What that means is plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or the water if they're living in water, and they take water from their roots and they use the energy and light to fix that carbon from the carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate like uh, glucose. And then of course they release oxygen as a byproduct. What that really means is that plants are chemical factories. They are making all of their organic molecules. They don't really absorb organic molecules or ingest them like an animal does. They can actually make them. I mean, it's amazing that a plant can make proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, which are all your fats, waxes, oils, and a lot of different types of signaling molecules like steroids and all of their secondary metabolites like chlorophyll and all the other pigments that make them orange or blue or red. They make every one of those molecules from carbon dioxide, water, and some minerals that they absorb from the ground that include like phosphates and nitrates and calcium and things like that. But it's amazing that plants can do that. So plant body plan, they have to have access to sunlight and they need a way to absorb nutrients. So almost all plants have roots, shoots, leaves, and most plants have a vascular system connecting the roots and the shoots and the leaves together. That makes sense. With the exception, of course, are the bryophytes that do not have a vascular system. And in fact, we call those non-vascular plants. Now, whether or not you're a root or a leaf or a stem, or you're some modified structure to store energy, size and shape really matter for form and function. You would expect leaves to increase their surface area because they're trying to intersect sunlight, right? Roots might be tubular because they're trying to absorb water and minerals from the ground. And how they do that will be the subject of another lecture. Or you might be round like a potato or an onion to maximize your volume for storage. So. Let's begin with the roots of a plant. We're gonna do roots, then shoots and leaves. So roots, I mean, what do roots do? We all know this. You know, they anchor plants to the soil and they're where the plant absorbs nutrients and water. And they're where the plant absorbs nutrients and water and sometimes they can store energy as well. Most of the time, most of the time. There are exceptions to this. Roots are even more versatile than that. So here's a diagram of a plant. And of course, you can see that the roots are down in the soil, anchoring the plants to the soil. And as they absorb all of their nutrients and water, the vascular system will then transport it up to the leaves. Now, roots are living systems and they're eukaryotes. That means they need energy as well. And so they get all of their energy is from the leaves and the vascular system transports like the secondary metabolites, secondary metabolites, there I go again, anything that a plant makes after a glucose molecule, 
is a secondary metabolite. Secondary just means it comes second and metabolite just think metabolism. They're just making lots of different chemicals. And then so the vascular system will then transport these secondary metabolites to the roots to support the roots with the energy they need and things they need to continue to grow. And of course, when roots absorb water and minerals, they use both passive transport and active transport to absorb these nutrients. And like I said, I'm gonna go into great detail about how roots absorb nutrients in a later lecture. So there's a great photo of a stream bank that's been washed away, exposing the roots of this tree. You can see how it anchors it to the ground. And the roots are basically, they have what is a tap root for a lot of trees. That tap root is a main root that shoots down into the soil. By growing deep, it can really hold the tree in place, but it can also absorb water that might be deeper down. And then off of the main tap root comes a lateral roots. And whenever you see a tree blow down, look in the middle, you'll see the tap root and you'll see all the lateral roots on the side of it. And together this forms a tap root system. Now, believe it or not, for some plants, the root system might be as much as 80% of the tree's biomass. So when you look at a plant, a lot of the actual plant is below ground. We just don't see it. Plant root systems are diverse. I mean, typically we think about these tap roots growing straight down, lateral roots growing off of it. But you can also have fibrous roots. Think grass. Fibrous roots, there's no main tap root. You send these roots down into the soil and they do a really good job of holding on to the soil and preventing a lot of the water from running off. That's why we often use grasses for erosion control. Now, we got tap roots, lateral roots, fibrous roots, but there's just an incredible amount of variability among roots. You know, we say their roots help plants stay in one place because they anchor them to the soil. Not if you're a floating plant, water hyacinth, water lettuce. There's these floating plants like duckweed as well. Their roots just go down into the water and they absorb water and nutrients from the water itself as a plant just kind of floats around on the surface. And uh, so they're not growing into the soil. There are parasitic plants. I know, parasitic plants. They grow into the roots or into the stems of other plants. So, you know, mistletoe made famous by Christmas. Yeah, mistletoe is a type of parasitic plant. They send their roots into the vascular tissue of their host plant and they pull nutrients from them. And uh, in some cases, parasitic plants are photosynthetic. So if you see mistletoe and it's green, it's doing photosynthesis. Others have actually given up their ability to do photosynthesis. We always say plants grow downward into the soil. Well, if you're in wetlands, the soil might be really anoxic. Anoxic, there I go again. The soil, because it's all mud and water, there might be very, very little oxygen in the mud or none because any little bit of oxygen that's around is quickly being used by a microbe to break down the organic matter. So these wetlands often become anoxic. They, they become low or no oxygen areas. Well, plants, their roots are made up of eukaryotic cells. They do cellular respiration. They need oxygen just like you and I, just not much of it. So in some cases, plants like a cypress tree what they'll do is they'll send their roots up into the air. They'll grow up to get oxygen to keep the roots from dying. So that's pretty cool. Okay, roots exhibit phenotypic plasticity. I, man, more words, but let's break this down. Phenotype from genetics, that's your outward appearance. How do you look? What color are your eyes? What color is your hair? What color is your flower? What color? Is your seed, what shape is your seed? These outward expression of your genes, that is your phenotype. Plasticity, plastic, it's bendable, it's moldable. Well, it turns out that roots, even amongst the same trees, can be very plastic. They can respond to their environment. So for example, imagine you've got a tree in a wet environment. And we'll start using this word water potential. So if you have high water potential, you are in a wet environment. Water is easily available to you. So if you live in a place that has high water potential, think like the Southeast, right? 
not necessarily in sand in the southeast, but in the clay areas in the southeast, you have lots of water available to you. You might have deeper roots. And interestingly, you, uh, you might help promote the growth of other plants. Now, as you go westward, water potential declines as you get drier and drier. And in these cases, the roots might be shallower and spread out more along the ground to absorb any amount of rainfall that lands. And in this case, because water is very scarce, you might actually prevent other plants from growing there. And this is amongst the same trees. Now, root systems not only exhibit this ability to respond to the environment from the same species, but amongst different species. There are many different types of diversity among the roots. And we expect this, right? Like I said, I mean, we find plants living underwater, yes, in both aquatic and marine environments, to living in rainforests, to living along the coast, to living in deserts. So you can imagine root systems are quite diverse. So they're modified. One is an adventitious root. You ever walked along and seen like um, vines growing on the side of a house? And if they're ivy, if you look closely, you'll see these little roots coming off the stems to hold it onto the house or the fence or the tree, whatever it's growing on. And in those cases, the roots are not growing into the ground. They are anchoring the vine to whatever surface is growing on, and they're absorbing nutrients and water. So this is an adventitious root. You can see the ivy there. You can also have modified prop roots or aerial roots. A lot of plants that grow in wet environments, they might have these prop roots. And what they do is they help increase stability of the plant. And if you're like a bread mangrove, not only are they good for increasing um, the stability of the plant, but they also allow for some air exchange as well. And ecologically, a red mangrove swamp like the one on the right, there are so many different things in that area. Like this picture here from John Pennycamp. We couldn't go out on the reef that day, so I'm like, well, I just throw my mask and snorkel and, and snorkel around the mangroves. I had never done that. I was blown away at the diversity of life I saw on the roots of these mangrove trees. So they're incredibly ecologically important. And I've already talked about this, these things called nematophores. These are a type of aerial root. And in the South, we just call them cypress knees. These are roots coming up from the ground, coming up from the water that allow for gas exchange to the cypress trees that are growing in water. And if you're in further southern areas, you might see a tree called a black mangrove. And those black mangroves will send up tiny little roots once again for air. And as you can imagine, roots are incredibly varied. So these are some different root adaptations, all the way from buttressing, like you might find in a rainforest, to aerial roots, to prop roots, to adventitious roots. So that's not all roots do. You know, in addition to anchoring the plant or absorbing nutrients, they can also store nutrients. So as a plant is growing and the leaves are photosynthesizing, they will actually send nutrients down to certain modified roots like carrots, radishes, beets. Let's take a look. Carrots, wait, I know that's carrot top. You know, I was at Florida State in the mid nineties when they invited him to come to our powwow. And we ended up, well, I didn't ban him, but Florida State ended up banning him because he talked about pot. Yeah, that was 25 years ago. We've come a long way since. But these carrots, these are modified tap roots used for storage. And of course, the orange color from them is from carotenoids, like beta carotene. And we can use that to make vitamin A. So yes, in our early childhood development, it's important to get that for good eyesight. And in fact, a lot of children go blind every year from vitamin A deficiencies. So yes, carrots are very good for you. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> yeah, Dwight Schrute from The Office, one of the funniest characters in the history of television, at least in my opinion. He was a beet farmer. So in addition to being a paper salesman and a black belt in karate, he had a 60-acre farm and he sold beets. And he was a big Battlestar Galactica fan too. And... Um, Beets are really dark colored because they've got a pigment in them called anthocyanin, which is the same as in blueberries. It's very healthy for you. So if you can eat a beet, good job. They're very healthy for you. 
I, I'll pass. I can do this stuff ground up in a smoothie sometimes, but I'm not a big beet fan. But some people love them. They're also used in asexual reproduction. Out of here, one of my favorite trees is a quaking aspen. And uh, this aspen grove was burned, oh, about five or six years ago in southern Colorado. Kind of sad that there was a big wildfire. And in fact, the West is kind of having a wildfire problem. But here's a good thing. If you look closely, you see all that green underneath? Those are baby aspen trees growing up from the roots. So this is an adaptation, you know? So if you get this forest fire, you don't have to wait for seeds to germinate. You survived underground in your roots and you start sending up new trees. And in fact, in the West, you might be hiking out in the mountains and you come across an entire grove of aspen trees. It might be three or four trees. It might be as many as several thousand trees covering 30 or 40 acres. Interestingly, all those trees, they could be one individual. One, because they're all clones of each other, because they're sending up suckers. They're sending up new trees from their roots and they're reproducing asexually. So there you have it. Roots are incredibly varied in both their form and function. And they do more than just anchor plants to the ground and absorb nutrients. They can be used to store nutrients and they can also be used in asexual reproduction. So I hope you have a little bit more appreciation now for plant roots and their incredible variability. So stay tuned for my next lecture on shoots and leaves. This has been Tom Kennedy Science.